The militarization of U.S. police and law enforcement. How pervasive is it and what kind of toll is it having? Hello, I'm Arnold Nido and this is The Heat. The Black Lives Matter protests and calls for an end to police abuse following the death of George Floyd, an unarmed African-American, have shone a new bright light on the issue of police militarization in the United States. It's a trend that's been growing for years and involves billions of dollars worth of military-style equipment provided to police departments by the U.S. Defense Department. But why did it happen and why are more and more people saying it's time to stop it? We begin with this report from CGTN's John Gilmore. This is not a war zone. It's Minneapolis, with riot police trying to take control of the streets. Their military-style vehicles, weapons and tactics are now commonplace across the United States. They were on full display in response to the Black Lives Matter protests that followed the death of George Floyd in police custody. But what's happening now is not new. Over the last two decades, U.S. law enforcement has become increasingly militarized. That's been helped by a controversial Defense Department program that has provided over $7 billion worth of excess or unused military equipment to about 8,000 agencies across America. All at little cost and supported by President Trump. In fact, that stuff is disappearing so fast we have none left. You guys know how to, you, you really knew how to get that. But that's my honor, and I'll tell you what, it's being put to good use. Police get everything, from military-style guns, to helicopters, to armored vehicles. All the way to the right. California Santa Paula police deployed in this to help Los Angeles during recent protests. And it's not just big cities arming up. We're here today to talk about our MRAP, M-R-A-P, mine-resistant ambush protected vehicle even smaller communities like this one on florida are rolling out war zone style bomb resistant vehicles called mraps law enforcement agencies argue this type of equipment can save lives if officers are confronted by terrorism or responding to mass shootings like this incident in san bernardino california i got high i got high but critics say increased police militarization encourages a culture of confrontation with officers looking and acting like soldiers at war. Police department, third warrant! Police department, third warrant! Battlefield-style tactics are being blamed for an overly aggressive style of policing, sometimes even used for search warrants, like this incident in Evansville, Indiana. Protesters on America's streets this summer have demanded an end to police abuse, they say is partly caused by militarization. And for many, that means pushing police to give up their military-style weapons and equipment. John Gilmore, CGTN. There is much to discuss. Joining me now from Baltimore is Debbie Hines. She's a trial lawyer, legal analyst, and former prosecutor. With us, too, from, via Skype from Washington, D.C., is Talisa Carter. She's an assistant professor of law and criminology at American University. Also joining us via Skype from South Carolina is Mark Claxton. He is the director of public relations at the Black Law Enforcement Alliance, and he's a retired detective with the New York Police Department. And joining us, too, from Atlanta is Rashad Ritchie. He is a talk show host and political analyst. Thank you to all of you for being with us. Mark Claxton, let me start with you. Uh, the militarization of police in the United States, this has been taking place for years, for decades, really. We see these weapons and these vehicles, which actually come from the battlefield, but we now see them on the streets of the United States. Um, has this changed the way in which police do their jobs, in which uh, the law is, in the way in which the law is enforced? Uh, absolutely. I think it's unavoidable that when you introduce into uh, this uh, civilian sector militarized weaponry and armor, cars, et cetera, that there will be a shift in the manner in which enforcement is done by local police uh, agencies. Let's keep in mind that this program, this 1033 program, has uh, been in effect since 97 uh, under uh, Bill Clinton's administration. Initially, the idea was that these 
these vehicles, this weaponry, the equipment would be used in the ongoing war on drugs. But, uh, you know, listen, whenever you have equipment available or a costume available, you, you act accordingly uh, to what you're wearing or what you're able to step inside of. And that has truly really transferred on to just basic enforcement models, public disorder, rea um, uh, response by local police agencies, etc., has really been affected, negatively impacted by the introduction of these military uh, equipment. You know, Mark, I was wondering about the relevance of some, uh, some of the equipment that's used. In that report we just saw, we heard those police officers talk about the MRAP, which is a mine-resistant ambush vehicle. I mean, what relevance does a vehicle like that have in a civilian setting like the streets of cities and towns around the country? Well, that, that is very much part of the criticism that many people have with this program, uh, that there are some agencies and departments across the nation who are just... Uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to uh, acquire the goods, not necessarily because they have a need for it. Part of the discussion in some uh, reform models is about having agencies and departments demonstrate the actual need for these type of for this type of equipment. And I, I, I do suspect, I know that many agencies and entities will have a difficult time if they actually have to articulate uh, a justifiable need. Uh, to acquire some of this equipment. But that just goes to show you that, that a lot of it, especially early on, uh, was really just given out really just haphazardly to agencies that had no real specific need for it. But once they got it, they found a way to use it. That meant in, in terms of uh, breaking up some uh, public protest, they use it there. It involved uh, search warrants, which is becoming, throughout the nation, is becoming heavily over-militarized, the response or the um, execution of search warrants, that's where they'll use it as well. So it, it's a program that is, is ripe for abuse, and I'm sure there has been some uh, abuse going on in the program. Debbie Hines, people talk about police officers looking more like soldiers. We look at these military-style SWAT operations around the country. Um, what is your assessment of what is happening? I mean, this seems so far uh, detached from serving a community, helping a community. You know, it's interesting. I think it goes back even further than the original um, act of, 19, of 1997 that was um, um, enacted under Bill Clinton's administration. I think if you're looking at it from a historical uh, point of view, and I was a history major, I think it really goes back to what was happening really in um, 1992 with the Rodney King uprising. Uh, there was some military um, equipment that was used then, and that was obviously before the 1997 Act. But it goes back even further than that. It goes back all the way, I believe, back to the Resurrection Act, um, the Intersection Act, which was in 1807, which was really the whole purpose of that, although there was a military rise equipment back then, but the whole purpose was to control, and it was to control slaves and to control slave revolts. And I think that really that's the underlying reason that it is being used right now today. I meant to say the Resurrection Act, but it is being used right now today for the same purpose, to control people. And when the people we're talking about controlling are African American and their allies, there is no purpose for having on the streets of the United States a um, equipment that is mind resistant. I mean, there's no protester, no person that I've ever prosecuted that is going to be coming into um, weapons that are going to be needed that a mind resistant equipment would be used for. So I think when we're going back and looking at the U.S. history and putting everything into perspective, any equipment of this type does date back even further, but it is just a modern-day version of some of the things that were happening even long before 20 years ago. Rashad Ritchie, the use of military-style tactics, military equipment to shut down protests is not new. We saw that in Ferguson in 2014. Um, that was just a few years ago. Why do you think there is this ho overwhelming use of force, this show of force on the streets? Because they don't get it. Uh, this particular program, obviously, operates almost like a military occupation rather than an expression of community policing. Let's be very clear about what's really happening. The United States of America is in the moral battle for her soul. 51% of Americans are saying it's time to demilitarize the police. That's what's happening. You have these forces 
who could care less about the occupation or the policing, and they simply want to have a great show of force. Here's what studies have shown. Studies have shown clearly that this militarization of our police agencies, it has not made cops safer, it has not made communities safer, and it has been utilized to target black, brown, and poor communities time and time again. Another study showed that this, this militarized uh, tactic actually makes cops less safe because when the average citizen sees this image in their community, they start losing confidence in law enforcement. So it actually increases the divide between police officers and the community. We're in the uh, 21st century. Uh, it is time for us to reimagine what policing is. It is time for us to eliminate some of these um, old-style tactics that didn't work. And remember, the premise of this was in the 90s. The war on drugs was the catalyst they utilized to provide political covering to create this militarized um, agency in our policing. Well, the war on drugs was um, ill-conceived. It was fought inappropriately. And today, we have reimagined what that element is. We're no longer calling it a war on drugs. We're treating people that are on drugs as they should be. They are um, patients and not criminals. And we have come to a sense of uh, individuals who are convicted of drug charges getting 50, 60 years to life. We're saying that they never should have received that much uh, time in the first place. So if we're saying all of that about the premise of the action uh, that created the militarization of police, we now need to look at the militarization of police as flawed as well. All right, let me bring in Talisa Carter. She's uh, with us here in Washington. Uh, Talisa, when we look at some of the equipment, some of the tactics that were used just in the most recent protest that we saw after the death of George Floyd, I mean, what kind of message does that send to people when we see police, or for that matter, the people who order police to do this, what kind of message does that send to uh, protesters? Yeah, the message is clear that we're enemies. And so that's essentially the narrative that this kind of equipment pushes and is pervasive, particularly in black, brown, and disadvantaged communities, that there's an us versus them mentality, that they, people are deserving of not only punishment, but severe punishment, of brutal punishment, of the, the same treatment that we treat people who are, who we've declared war on, we're declaring war in our own backyard, right, in our own communities, across the railroad tracks, across Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. War is here. And so because it's, it's us versus them, because these, this equipment signals that you're not one of us. And even if you're protesting, even if you're protesting in peace, even if you're protesting for rights, for life, for a reason to live, in a, in a body that's not white, not heterosexual, not cis, not the majority, because you just want to live. All, this, all these machines do, this equipment d does, is say that you're not welcome. You're not welcome in the place that you were born. And, Talisa, if good policing is about building relationships, building relationships between police and communities that they serve, uh, having confidence, both sides having confidence in each other, uh, are we ever going to get there if this kind of equipment is seen on the street? No. So there's a relationship that exists right now. It's interesting. So when I teach this to my class, there's oftentimes the narrative is we need to build relationships. There are relationships. They just are negative ones. We need to transform relationships. We need to change the narrative. And that's hard. Building trust between two individuals that you maybe you've known all your life, sometimes that's hard. So between institutions and communities, between people who, as my co-panelist said, have been oppressed since the inception of this country, that's going to be hard, harder than hard. It's going to require change that is radical, that's uncomfortable for both sides. It's going to require a leap of faith, trust that, unfortunately, we haven't demonstrated well in this country. Mark Claxton, you were a police officer, a detective in uh, New York City, one of the country's biggest cities. Um, how difficult was your job made when you tried to establish a good relationship with people, with communities, by the fact that, you know, officers were decked out in military gear, military vehicles were on the streets? Well, it's, it's, it's challenging. Just police work it itself is challenging enough when you add that extra element of a militarized response, it becomes almost impossible to develop 
sound, solid, uh, working relationships with the community. You know, as the panelists indicated, that the, the, the symbolism behind the military regalia and equipment is that we are on, are on opposite sides. And that does nothing to enhance a community uh, policing model. It's impossible to have a community policing model when you uh, reflexively utilize uh, militarized equipment and a militarized response. So there's an obligation, I think, in, in those who believe that there should still be a policing uh, 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 regiment in our country, there is an obligation to shift, to revolutionize and shift the policing focus away from militarized responses into a more community-based response model. Uh, and to try to, to work for decades coming to reestablish or establish for the first time in many communities sound, solid, respectful relationships. Uh, you know, some people consider that a pipe dream, but if there is to be policing moving forward for decades and centuries to come, the, the responsibility and the time is now to shift revolutionary, uh, uh, revolutionize uh, policing, if you will, to shift away from militarized responses and deal directly with the community-based models right. of uh, policing and service-oriented policing. Uh, Mark, of course, police face all kinds of challenges during their daily work. I mean, they, it could range from resolving domestic disputes to robberies, to armed robberies, even to murder. But what about those who say that police also have to deal with things like terrorist attacks, and this kind of equipment is needed when you're dealing with that? Listen, there is, a, there is a need for equipment, certain equipment under cer certain circumstances, but that's not what we're seeing uh, now. What we're seeing is that it, it appears for any response, especially if there's going to be crowd, a crowd involved, the police reflexively go to the military equipment. They want to show a force. They want to initiate contact. They want to utilize and show the equipment uh, that is there that, that, that displays as militarized kind of position and the us against them mentality that that has corrupted uh, the police culture if you will yeah so and and to be clear about something you know listen uh, police when you sign up for the job you know you're you're, you're not a victim you're a volunteer uh -huh. you understand the dangers the risks the challenges the expectations the requirements all that stuff is laid out on the table and on top of that you get paid for it so uh, I'm not all that careful or concerned about this oversensitive police uh, policing that we're seeing now right. that's desperately needs reinforcement and pats on the back for doing their job. That's the job. You're not prepared to do it and take the slings and arrows along with it and, and the dangers that come with it, then, then you need to go in some other field. Debbie Hines, if we look at the United States, this is a very heavily armed country. In fact, there are more guns in this country than there are people. What would you say to those who say, look, I think it's a bit naive to think that police don't need this equipment when we're dealing with a very heavily armed population with people with a lot of guns? So here's what I'll say from my vantage point as being a former prosecutor and also from what the studies show. 90% of all crime that occurs in this country are misdemeanor crimes. To so think that uh, that crimes that are occurring, the majority are armed robberies or murders or gun um, use of guns is just not true. All of the African Americans and people of color that are in, sitting in jail right now today are there because of some type of a misdemeanor. And so that's number one, the fallacy, that they don't need it anyway because the 10% of all crime that does involve violence is just that, 10%. So I don't see any way that they would need it. And the other thing is, you know, uh, the police are to protect and serve. What are they protecting by using militarized equipment? And who are they really serving? Those are the questions. There's, they're not protecting African Americans. They're not protecting people of color by going into our communities and using that type of equipment. And they are certainly not serving us by using that equipment. And so I think that when we're talking about using the equipment, we have to understand that uh, that is not for the purpose of the community. As all the other panelists have said, the equipment is being used as if people of color, blacks, minorities are the enemy of the state. And that is why the equipment is being 
used to basically show a sense of force. But one of the things we haven't talked about is training, and police can't even use the weapons that they are given to go out on the street each and every day with. They don't know how to use those without killing unarmed black people. So there is no way under the sun that I think under any circumstances that they need any type of militarized equipment until they learn how to go into our communities, black and brown communities, and use the equipment that they already are using on themselves without killing unarmed black individuals. Rashad Ritchie, you know, you talked a moment ago about reimagining policing in the United States. Uh, what would that look like? We hear a lot of debate these days about defunding the police, uh, about restricting what they can and cannot do. But what would reimagining the police look like? Reimagining says this. Make sure you have more uh, community policing. And we're not talking about just a few. We're talking about the majority of your police department living in the community they serve. That way, it doesn't look like a military occupation of a foreign entity coming into a community. Also, making sure everyone applies the same standard when utilizing their body camera. If a cop does not turn on that body camera or if the footage does not make it to the precinct, that officer needs to be charged with uh, tampering with evidence. You know why? Because I will be charged with tampering with evidence if that happened. Also, holding cops to the same level of accountability as a citizen. If you commit assault as a cop while uh, in service of your uh, profession, then you can still be arrested for assaulting a citizen, period. And making sure that there's a psychological evaluation of, a, of an officer every six months to one year. Right now, most police agencies will do a psychological eval uh, upon hiring but then no longer require it unless something bad happens and it has to be mandated by a commanding officer. That needs to be common practice. And there are a lot of uh, various things we can do uh, just with how transparent we are with officers who have a record. There are cops in the community right now who have a track record of violating the rights of others. Well, I want to see that record and make it public. You know my record. If you pull me over, you get a list of my record. I want to see your record, too. And that needs to be housed directly in the city, on the city website. Those are good starts uh, to reimagining what police uh, what policing is and making sure also that money is taken away from the police department to actually address things like mental health disorders, um, poverty, as well as some of the underlying issues associated with criminality, drug addiction, alcohol addiction in those communities. No city, no county should ever brag about increasing the police department because that means you're reacting to crime rather than solving it. Talisa Carter, so we have a culture of militarization right now, and I'm wondering to what extent that influences the choices that police make, the kind of options that they have when they're dealing with the challenges that they have to. I mean, do they sometimes feel, look, uh, it's it's okay for us to get into a situation uh, of confrontation here yeah, rather than de-escalate a situation, use mediation rather. Yeah, absolutely. So socialization is real in any organization, any institution, any community, any environment. The same is true in policing. So a new recruit, right, no matter if they have the best intentions, once you're socialized and you need a check, as many of us do, to pay our bills, right, and you just want to do a good job, you learn things in training, but when you're on the job, that's the kind of training that they can't cover in a classroom. And oftentimes, the culture of a police department or an organization is passed down. It's, it, the diffusion of knowledge, informal, how, how it's done off the books, right? What happens in between policy, right? That really shapes the realities of the lived experiences of civilians who interact with the police. So. Absolutely. Recruitment, training, all these things matter, but the culture is something that oftentimes gets missed and overlooked because it's hard to capture in training. It's hard to capture formally. Mark Claxton, we have seen in these Black Lives Matter protests, there have been calls for police accountability, for an end to police abuse, uh, and as I mentioned, for an end, uh, for rather, moves to defund the police. Could any of that impact uh, the militarization of police forces? I think all of it will impact the militarization of uh, police forces. I think any time that you uh, increase accountability, uh, it has an impact on police departments. Any time you require, uh, uh, you, you increase enforcement, it has an impact. So all of the ideas and the reform initiatives and ideas will have some impact on the militarization of uh, police forces. However. The question is how much of an impact or whether it will be negligible or significant enough to shift uh, the focus, enough to impact, as the other guests mentioned, the culture of policing.
You see, because the culture can withstand uh, incremental changes, the policies and procedures, the culture can, the police culture can withstand even additional laws, rules, and regulations. So the question is, how much will the reform ideas that are being passed around, and many of them are excellent, uh, will have, what kind of impact will they have on police culture, which has become toxic and which uh, it, uh, is primarily responsible for uh, that which is which, which ails us and that which causes the death of black and brown uh, people and, and it causes uh, an infiltration in the black and brown communities, the abuse in those communities itself. We have to really just devise uh, methods to address directly the police culture and the toxicity of that culture. Debbie Hines, as Mark says, there are, there's a lot of debate right now over what reforms need to be introduced to be implemented. Um, what are your thoughts on that? What, what, are the, what are the reforms, in your view, that have the greatest merit? Well, here's the interesting thing. We're talking about culture, but what we haven't raised really is what is really the underlying um, elephant in the room, and that's racism. I mean, a lot of these police officers, they come into a community, and they come into a community already with racist ideas and how they feel. And I don't know what type of culture, what type of training can actually really do anything with respect to that. And then when you have African-American police officers, you know, you're in a job where your life depends on your partner. And it may depend on your racist partner for you to do your job. Job. And so I don't know what we can really do when we're trying to wean out racism, but that's where uh, a lot of the problem is, and that's where a lot of the problem stems from. Right. And I don't think that it's necessarily going to end by just having community uh, policing, although that would be a start. I basically feel we have to burn the house down and start basically from scratch, some way, some way, or somehow. And I think that, as I said before, right. we need to have police focusing on the 10 percent of the major crime and not the 90 percent. Yeah. Uh, Rashad Ritchie, this has also become a very a big political issue. I mean, we hear leaders from both parties in this country trying to outdo each other on how tough they could be on crime. So how big a challenge does that pose in trying to get change? Well, I think now there's a real contrast because you have President Trump. He's kind of leading this uh, mantra that somehow you need to continue to be tough on crime. Yeah. His political opposition is saying, no, we need to be smarter on crime. We need to look right. at holistic reform. Uh, so I see this as a contrasting political issue okay. when we get to the presidential election. All right, and we have to leave it there. Thank you to all of you for being with us. It's been a great discussion. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.